Thank you everyone for joining us today for the first of a series of webinars focused on the principles of plastic surgery. This series is hosted by Interplast and PraxHub. By joining us today, you now have access to the PraxHub education platform where you can access all of Interplast's education content for free. My name is Russell Corlett. I'm a recently retired plastic surgeon based in Melbourne, Australia. I've been working with Interplast for many years and had the privilege of visiting many countries across the Asia Pacific region and have worked alongside many of you. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Professor Mark Ashton. Mark is one of Australia's most respected and internationally renowned plastic and reconstructive surgeons. He's currently Chair of Plastic Surgery at the Epworth Freemasons Hospital and former Head of Plastic Surgery at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Today, Professor Ashton will be presenting on the basics of blood supply, taking viewers through a detailed explanation of vascular architecture, including all of the important communicating structures. He will explain how understanding this architecture is critical to the success of a plaque and how to apply this knowledge to clinical practice. Professor Ashton will take viewers through a number of examples of application to practice, concluding with some key pearls to take away and some pitfalls to avoid. Now, over to you, Mark. Thank you, Russell. Okay, so what, what we're trying to do here, if, if we can, is uh, I'm going to start right at the very start and bring everyone up uh, to speed. So as we go through, hopefully bring people along with us so it becomes very clear about what we're trying to say. The first thing I'd like to point out is that um, the blood supply is unpredictable. These are two slides taken by Russell and my uh, colleague, Professor Ian Taylor, back in the 1970s. And the two things that strike you immediately about this uh, uh, flap is, first of all, that we have two flaps which are the same width on the same part of the body, raised by the same surgeon at the same time, and yet one survives completely and one dies completely. Or if we come across here, and this gentleman sitting up in bed, we can see that two flaps raised by the same surgeon at the same time. This flap survives completely, and this flap dies about two thirds of the way along. Why? The answer to this probably comes firstly from this chap called Stuart Milton. So Stuart Milton is a very uh, well-known plastic surgeon in London in 1970 and renowned as being a lateral thinker. And what he was doing is he was using a blue dye called disulfene blue. And he was trying to show that where the disulfene blue, the blue dye goes to, is the very good way of assessing the perfusion of tissue. So what he's done in the top slide here is he's saying, well, that's how much the tissue is being perfused and that is therefore that tissue is going to die. And then on the way through, for reasons that he thought was just playing around, I just wanted to make sure I've got the right uh, methodology here. He then divided this tissue into different width flaps, not expecting anything to happen. And as we pick up here, we can see that, yes, indeed, where the blue dye is, is indeed where the perfusion stops and starts and the tissue beyond the blue dye hasn't got any vascular supply or any blood getting to it and it dies. But the other thing is that it made no difference as to how wide or narrow the flaps were because the tissue still died as it did at the start. So to put it in another way, it doesn't matter how wide the base of your flap is, it's related to the intrinsic blood supply of the tissue that determines how much of that flap is going to live or die. So you can have a flap that is 16 centimetres wide and another flap that is two centimetres wide and they will die at exactly the same place. So the first concept I wanted to bring to you is that we know that the vascular architecture is based in its embryology and it is constant, it doesn't change. This is work 
done by Damien Bates in our lab some 10 years ago. And what it shows is that when the blood supply first develops, it develops with a central arteri arterial uh, communication going out into the limb. And around the outside is a periphery of veins, a plexus of veins that drain the blood away. And we can see that here. At a later stage, a secondary uh, blood supply develops, and that is where the veins join up alongside this central artery. So the secondary venous system is the vena comitantes that, exo that um, are associated with all the major um, arteries in the body, but particularly in the limbs. It explains why you can raise a radial forearm flap on either the cephalic vein up here or on the vena comitantes associated with the radial artery and both are equally effective. And we can see that that's replicated all over the body. The facial vein in the face, the superficial circumflex iliac vein, superficial inferior epigastric vein, another examples. The other thing, this is work from Ian Taylor very early on in the piece, uh, showing that the architecture of the uh, body is remarkably similar amongst different animals. So if we looked at the superficial temporal artery of the human and compare it to the monkey, to the rabbit and to the pig, we can see that that vascular architecture is exactly the same. The only thing that has changed is that where the function of that particular part of the body requires more blood supply, then the relevant artery gets bigger and longer. But the architecture itself, the template itself, is the same. And indeed, if we look at over time, so a 20-week fetus, 28-week fetus, and a 75-year-old woman, you can see that the template, the pattern of the superficial temporal artery is exactly the same and doesn't change. So why is this important? It's important because it means that we can predict patterns and therefore we can predict vascular behavior. And with some of the recent technology that's become available, we can now do that preoperatively and I'm gonna take you through some of that. We know that vessels emerge from the deep fascia to supply the overlying integument. Integument, I mean the skin, the fat, all that tissue that's sitting above the deep fascia. And we can map these now. So this is what's called a CT angiogram. And what we do is we inject dye into a patient about 10 to 15 seconds before we take a scan. And then we use a computer to assimilate a three-dimensional picture of that artery. And here we can see a blood vessel coming out from the rectus muscle in the abdomen, just next to the belly button, and ramifying out into the surrounding overlying fat and soft tissue of the lower abdomen. So it allows us to get a three-dimensional picture of the course of that artery through the soft tissue. And we can see where it is, how it courses through the fat, where the branches come off. And so therefore it allows us very accurately if we wanted to make the flap thinner or smaller, we know where to take tissue without compromising the blood supply to the rest of the flap. Two, vessels or perforators cross from one tissue plane to another at fixed points. This is picked up very early by a chap called Carl Manchot uh, in the early 1830s and reiterated by Ian Taylor and his co-workers. But what we'll find is that vessels and nerves and lymphatics move from the deep plane under the deep fascia into the overlying soft tissue at points where the two are fixed together. This is an Another view of the face, and you can see the facial artery, branches of the, uh, of the maxillary artery and the facial nerve are all using the same ligamentous attachment 
from the deep fascia into the skin to hitchhike, if you were, from one tissue plane to another. And we can see this here. This is an intraoperative uh, photograph. Here's the masseteric fascia, the fascia sitting over the top of the masseter muscle. Here's these ligaments. This is the buccal fat pad. This is from looking in front of the ear, looking towards the nose. And we can see here is the branches of the facial nerve. Here's the arteries associated that we talked about before. And you can see the nerves and the arteries are both using the ligaments to go from deep to superficial. Another example you can see here, here is the facial branch, the branch of the facial nerve coursing along the bottom of this space here, coursing along to enter that deep, um, the superficial tissue at the end of the slide. Why? So why is it that nerves and arteries are going from one tissue plane to another at point to fixation. To understand that, we need to go back just a little. So as we all know, I think all of us can remember from our medical student days that the integument is composed of five separate layers. Layer one, which is the subdermis and the dermis. Two is the underlying fat. Three is variable, um, but in the face, it's the SMAS. In the abdomen, it's scarpus fascia. In the scrotum, it's datos fascia. Um, underneath that, we have a layer called four. And then layer five is made up by the deep fascia or the periosteum, depending on what part of the body you are. Blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics emerge from layer five to supply the overlying deep tissue. Sorry, overlying soft tissue. And they do that in association with the ligaments binding layer five to the layers one, two, and three. We know that layers one, two, and three are very tightly bound together. And we can see that a bit like this tree diagram, which comes courtesy of Brian Mendelssohn, we can see that the ligaments pass through layer three, layer two, and layer one obliquely, but are anchored down to the deep fascia by a central core ligament. And so wherever you see a ligament, you're also going to see lymphatics, arteries, veins, and nerves. Layer four is variable. Remember I said layers one, two, and three are tightly bound together, always. And we have the deep fascia underneath. So the only variable is layer four. So it may rigidly fix layer three to layer five, as it does in the palm of the hand or the sole of the foot. And there we see lots of multiple ligaments binding and holding layer one, two, and three to the deep fascia or the periosteum. Or there may be a gap and the ligaments and the vessels are spaced wide apart as we are here. So here we have a gap and we have one, two, and three, again, being tightly bound together. And again, arteries, veins, ligaments, and nerves going from layer five to this composite in association with the ligaments. Classic example of this would be the flank or the edge of the abdomen. And this gap between those ligaments may be filled with loose areola tissue, as it is in the flank, like this, or a bursa, as it is in and around the knee. Why? The answer is because of mobility. What is the function of that tissue? It's a slide that comes from Brian Mendelssohn's 2008 lecture theories. And he makes the point that if I've got a muscle here and I want that muscle to move, that is to move this tissue, I can't have a ligament in the middle because it will stop that muscle being able to move. So therefore, the muscles are sitting in between the ligaments and to allow or facilitate movement underneath that muscle, between layer three and layer five, there must be a space. Otherwise, the muscle is ineffective. And so if we were to look at this 
again, so this is now expanding that concept. So if we, for example, had the deep fascia here and we had a muscle sitting here and we know that arteries have to get from the deep fascia into the soft tissue in association with these ligaments, then it means that we know that the arteries are going to be at the edge of this space. And indeed, if we were to expand that even further, it would make sense that if we look at something like the breast, we're going to have the pectoralis major sitting here. There's going to be a relatively avascular plane underneath the pectoralis major. And the arteries are going to then course on either side of the pectoralis major. So they're going to course at the sternal attachment here and course all the way up to the nipple. Or the lateral thoracic artery is going to use ligaments at the lateral extent of pectoralis major where serratus anterior attaches and use those ligaments to supply the breast. And indeed, that's what we see. This is a cross-sectional anatomy arterial gram of the breast. Here is the nipple in the middle. This is a study we did back in the early 2000s. Here is the second intercostal perforator coursing up to supply the nipple. And here are the branches of the lateral thoracic coursing directly through the breast. But there is a relatively avascular area immediately underneath pectoralis major. And we know that all the commu important communicating structures, nerves, arteries, ligaments, and veins will all use those ligaments we talked about for support. So if we have a ligament, what's going to happen is that the ligament is going to be at the edge of the space. And in, in association with that ligament, we're going to have nerves, arteries, lymphatics, all utilizing that ligament to gain access to the superficial integument, as we saw there, and as this diagram is showing here. And as we saw before, to reiterate that point, deep fascia, this is that photograph we saw before, but to re-emphasize, deep fascia, arteries and branches of the facial nerve, all using the ligaments at the edge of this space to go from layer five to layers one, two, and three. And so, to summarize again, depending on the ligaments, perforating vessels merging through layer five may be close, closely spaced together or widely spaced apart. So ligaments and therefore the vessels may be closely spaced together or widely spaced apart. This is my diagram trying to explain what I'm trying to say. We can have vessels like this. And again, as we talked about, that's the palm of the hand or the sole of the foot. Or we can have vessels like this, where they are widely spaced apart. Interestingly, when you have multiple small vessels, they tend to be uh, closely aligned together and smaller. When the vessels are more widely spaced apart, they tend to be solitary and bigger. And it follows therefore that the geographical arrangement of the ligaments therefore determines the location of the perforators. And in a simple system, this determines how much of your flap survives. What do I mean by that? This is a study done by Ian Taylor that we published about five years ago. And just taking you through this, this is the uh, abdomen of a dog. And what we've done is we have raised three flaps that are the same width by the same surgeon on the same place of the dog. The difference is that they're all raised on this green perforator, but the second perforator is different. And if we look at this in greater detail, we can see that we can safely capture all the tissue in between the two perforators, but the tissue beyond that second perforator is the tissue that gives us grief. So if we were to look here, this tissue here 
has died, this tissue here has died, but none of this tissue here has died. And the reason is because the distance from this perforator to this perforator is the full length of the flap. So if you have a perforator at the end of your flap, your flap will completely survive. If you have a perforator very close to the base of your flap, you're at risk of losing all of your flap, as has happened here. But the body isn't simple, so let's move on. For that, I'm just going to ask a question if we can. So this is a, a poll question to hopefully ensure that I'm making sense. So the first question is, to safely raise a flap, I need to make the base width as wide as possible, a width which is determined by the internal blood supply of the flap, or it doesn't matter. The internal blood supply is the correct answer there. That's what's going to determine how much of your flap survives, and how you should be raising your flap. So to safely raise a flap, I need the mate, which is determined by its internal blood supply. Next concept I want to introduce here is the concept of what we call an angiosome. And that is the block of tissue, the three dimensional block of tissue that a particular artery or perforator supplies. And the best way to imagine that, this is a flap that I raised from the abdomen where we have abdominal tissue, fat, and skin being raised on a single artery and a single vein. And the vascular connection between these territories or angiosomes is either by true or choke anastomosis. And this is critically important. So I'll go through it a little bit further. So this is the original diagram from 1987 by Ian Taylor, in which he describes that two perforating vessels coming through the deep fascia are connected by an arrangement like this, which he called a choke or a restricting, ser restricting series of vessels, or like this, in which there is no reduction in caliber and effectively the two vessels are joined as one. This would be a choke anastomosis, a true anastomosis. And this is a latex study I did last year, just showing the angular artery and the dorsal nasal artery being connected by choke anastomoses. And in this diagram, they're connected by true anastomoses. So in this study, these two arteries are acting effectively as if they were one. In this situation, they are acting as if they are separate. Importantly, these two vessels, choke vessels and true anastomoses, are functionally different. This is a study that we did where we looked at the time for tissue to rewarm after we cooled it down. And what we found was that where two arteries were joined by true anastomoses, that the rate at which tissue rewarmed or the rate at which blood flowed from one territory to another was significantly faster if it was connected by true anastomoses Whereas if it was the two arteries were connected by choke anastomoses, it took significantly longer for the tissue to warm up. And so one analogy would be that a true anastomosis is like a major freeway interconnecting two cities or two major perforators. Whereas a choke anastomosis is restrictive, holds the blood flow up, and doesn't allow the rapid trans the transfer of blood or anything else between the two arterial systems. And so where you have a flap that goes from one artery to another and it's interconnected by choke anastomoses, then the blood is not able to cross from one to the other and the tissue dies. If you have a flap which is interconnected by true anastomoses, then blood is readily able to get to all parts of the flap and therefore all of the flap survives, as it does here. And this is a key point. If you have a perforator which is connected or surrounded 
by choke anastomosis. So its connection with its surrounding neighbors is by a series of choke anastomoses, then the only tissue that you can safely and reliably raise is the tissue up to that choke zone interface or to that next perforator. But if the artery is connected by true anastomoses, then the individual perforators act effectively as one because they have a super highway joining them and it means a much greater or larger volume of tissue can be safely raised. So that was the basis of this paper here called the functional angiosome. And I suppose the next thing is you say, well, that's really good, Mark, but can we identify these true anastomoses before we operate? Because if we could identify where the true anastomoses are, then we can safely make much longer flaps and be absolutely certain that they're going to survive in their entirety. And we want to be careful not to raise flaps connected by choke anastomoses because we're going to run into strife. So this is uh, an infrared camera. Camera. This one on the left here is uh, a camera made by NEC. It's about forty-seven thousand US dollars, uh, and it takes a high-resolution infrared um, image. This little camera on the side here is called a FLIR camera. Um, this camera was released in two thousand and thirteen as an attachment to your smartphone, and it was aimed at air conditioning. Uh, technicians in the south, southern part of America, down in Texas, Louisiana, where everyone's air conditioners would develop leaks and they could never find out where the leaks were. And so they came up with this little camera. You plug in it to the side of your smartphone and it can see where the, air, the cold air coming from the air conditioner is leaking out of the pipe. That little camera costs about $390 and, as I said, just simply plugs into your phone. And we thought that that might be able to be used to help us. So this is with the $47,000 camera. And what we've done is we have got a simple ice pack from, that you use when, uh, from a, uh, a sports store or when you sprain your ankle or a knee or something like that. So one of those gel packs. And we've simply put it in the fridge and cooled the skin down to under about 20 degrees. So down to about 23 degrees. So from 37 down to 23 degrees, just by uniformly lying this gel pack on the back of this um, volunteer's calf. And then what we did is we took off the gel pack. And what's gonna happen then is blood from inside the body, deep to the deep fascia is gonna be at 37 degrees. And it's going to flow out into the overlying tissue at a set rate determined by your blood pressure and heart rate. And it's going to then warm up that tissue. And remember that diagram I showed you before, that choke and true anastomoses allow rewarming of tissue at different rates. So we can see here, here first of all are the perforators, they can be very clearly identified. And secondly, we can see that the interconnections between these perforators, because they're all at 28 degrees and are red, you can see that all these perforators are interconnected by true anastomoses. And the important thing about this study is that counterintuitively, this flap is going to be safer raised on the distal perforator rather than the proximal perforator because the proximal perforator is interconnected by choke anastomoses. And we look at an angiogram and that's exactly what we see. True anastomoses down here choke anastomosis up here, that we can determine before surgery without any investigation, simply by cooling the body down. To which you're gonna say, well, great Mark, $47,000, not everyone has that. I'll come to that in a minute. The other thing that uh, it does is it allows us to see very quickly, if we're in the middle of an operation, which perforators, which blood vessels are the ones I need to keep and which are the blood vessels that I need to, uh, that I can safely divide. So if we have, here's our CT angiogram down the bottom, and we can see we've got two perforators coming through the rectus muscle, and we can see this one here and this one here, we raise a flap, 
and we want to know what is the influence of this particular perforator on the flap. And all I did is I put a, one of those little clamps on this artery here and took another image about a minute later. And you can see all this tissue out to the side here, the so-called zone four, is turned blue and therefore would die. So if I raise this flap and didn't do something about this perforator, I'm going to lose half my flap. And I can do that inside the operation. So $47,000 is a lot of money and no one can afford that unless you're in a big university or something. But this little camera, as I talked about, the Fleur One, is three, about $399 and it simply goes into the end of your camera, into your smartphone. And you just simply, as we're doing here, this is our registrar, our fellow, you simply take a photograph of the abdomen after either putting a cold pack on it or wiping it with alcohol. And what you get is, sure, it's not the same image as the uh, $47,000 camera, but it still rapidly allows us to see where all the perforators are. So perforator here, perforator here, perforator here. And importantly, we can see how those perforators are interconnected. Are they connected by true anastomosis or choke anastomosis? So I'll come back to that and show you how we do that in a minute. So there's some critically important concepts that we've noticed when we started looking at the perforators and the interconnections. And I'll go through those one by one. The first is what we call the law of equilibrium. What we mean by that is that where you have one blood vessel, which is unusually big, then it tends to dominate or override all the other blood vessels in the area. And so the other vessels on the other side of the abdomen will be correspondingly small. So if I have a unusually big blood vessel here, then on the other side, I'm going to have very small blood vessels or none at all. In the deep system, so that's the deep uh, inferior epigastric artery system. And interestingly, the superficial system is correspondingly very big. And then on this side, it's correspondingly very small. So big, small, big, small, small, big. And we see that all the time. So what that means is that if you are looking for a particular perforator or blood vessel in your flap and you say, my goodness, all these vessels are incredibly small, it means that you're searching in this area here and you need to look either onto the other side, around the corner or dissect a little bit further. So for those of you who do uh, anterolateral thigh flaps and you're finding that you can't find a perforator, it's not there, I can almost 100% guarantee you that an anteromedial thigh flap will contain the big perforator. The second is this concept called delay. And delay is a, um, a strategic manipulation of tissue which has been around for ages. But what it allows us to do with, in conjunction with thermography is to raise very safe and very reliable tissue uh, flaps without the need for expensive microscopes or difficult microsurgery. And it allows you to minimize your flap loss quite significantly and dramatically. What it means is that if we get two perforators like this and we leave the two um, uh, the flaps, the edge of the flaps attached at one end and we divide this perforator choke zones interconnecting two perforators will be turned into true anastomoses. We know that this process takes about uh, 72 hours and is finished by a week. And once it's done, it is absolutely permanent and can't be reversed. So what that means is that we can, if we wanted to make a flap that goes in connecting perforators one, two, three, four, and in the rabbit, every perforator is connected by choke anastomosis. So if we did this without delay, as we've done here, we capture one and two, but we see three and four have died. Whereas if we use the process of delay, we can capture one, two, three, and four in one go. And notice that our choke anastomoses have been converted into true anastomoses. 
So how do we do that in an adult? So this is one of my patients. So we wanted to make a very large breast for her and we didn't want to do complicated microsurgical supercharging or uh, hooking up a different vessel to two different uh, donor vessels. And all we did is we identified our perforator here. We then made two incisions across the abdomen, leaving it attached at either end and divided all the other perforators in between so that we have this scenario here. Here's our perforator and this is her at a week down the track. And what that means is that we can then safely transfer all of that tissue on that single perforator safely and reliably and be absolutely certain that unlike that study we did before where we would have lost half our flap, this way we can keep all of that tissue. So how can we utilize this? So as I said, we can use the delay process to capture more tissue. And we can also use it as we talked about in that rabbit study to change the internal blood supply. We can convert choke anastomoses to true anastomoses. So here's one of my patients from last year. And you can see that we're trying to make a new breast for her after a mastectomy and she's slim. She doesn't want a tissue expander or an implant. She wants to use her own tissue. But when you see her tissue, you can see trying to capture enough tissue to make a breast to match the other side is going to be incredibly difficult. So what we decided to do is to do this process of delay. So first of all, we did a CT angiogram and we thought, okay, let's go and see what we can find. Well, when we looked at that, unfortunately what we found was that there were no blood vessels that were dominant or were suitable for transfer. So all of the blood vessels were either one millimeter or under, which meant that transferring that flap, in my hands anyway, has a significantly increased risk of surgical difficulty and is a significantly harder operation. So here's her CT angiogram before the uh, delay procedure. Here's the perforator that we decided, let, let's see, this is probably the biggest of the lot, but it's only one millimeter inside, in size. So then this is her, so we mark her out. So this is these perforators we decided on. We actually decided on this one here. I can't draw, sorry about that, but we've just transferred it out to there. And then what we're gonna do as we did before is we're going to undermine all the tissue around the perforator and we're going to leave it attached at the end. This area here is the choke zone. These are all the tissues and you can see, see how it's become hyperemic and quite different to the rest of the tissue here. It's clearly having, uh, it's not particularly happy at this particular time. This is then her at three days later and you can see that hyperemia persists, but you can see that we've been able to capture and keep all of the tissue on both sides of the abdomen. And then this is her at 10 days post-operatively where she's gone on to heal. And I did a repeat CT angiogram because I wanted to see what had happened to that perforator. Was it still in the same place? Was it still there? Had I damaged it? Had it clotted off? What we found was that, in fact, this perforator now had gone up from under one millimeter, it's gone up to 1.6 millimeters. So it's significantly increased in size and we know we can capture all of this tissue. So if we were to look at before and after, this is her CT angiogram before delay, this is after delay, and we can see that this perforator here has dramatically increased in size, and we can keep all of this tissue. Interestingly, we have some vessels which even though I've divided, have regrown back through that tissue. So this is her when I'm raising the flap, so this is before transferring the tissue, so now on the second operation, I've completely detached all of the tissue. Here's my pen sitting on that perforator, which is 1.6 millimeters now. And you can see that the flap is healthy from both ends on that perforator. And when I do the FLUR imaging, so with my $399 camera, I can see here is my perforator. 
you can say this is all interconnected by true anastomoses. This is a true anastomosis. And you can stay here. So perforator, 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 clearly connected by true anastomoses. This is after transferring that tissue onto the breast using microsurgery. And when we take the, do another fleur with the flap on the breast, we can see exactly the same thing. The vascular architecture hasn't changed. All that we've done is we've converted choke anastomoses into true anastomoses. So here's my perforator, which you can see with my pen. Here's the true anastomosis interconnecting. See that? True anastomosis interconnecting those original perforators. That's why the flap survives completely and gives us a nice breast reconstruction in someone who otherwise we would not have been able to transfer that volume of tissue safely and reliably. So, a poll question, if you can, can you please um, choose all of the ones that you believe are correct? So, the vascular anatomy of tissue is unable to be altered. Vascular anatomy of tissue can be altered by a process called delay. Delay takes three days to occur. Once a flap is delayed, the effect is permanent and can't be reversed. It's lifelong. So, um, so, yeah, so first question. So vascular anatomy is unable to be altered. That's incorrect. We're able to show that delay converts choke anastomoses into true anastomoses. Vascular anatomy can be altered by a process called delay. That is correct. Yes, delay takes three days to occur. So it occurs within three days. And once a flap is delayed, the effect is permanent and can't be, for, can't be reversed. That's correct. So how do I use this? What do I do? So what I'm gonna do is just take you through a simple uh, flap and hopefully this will make sense. So this is um, one of my patients. So she had an angiosarcoma. Sorry about this. this, is the only slide I could see beforehand, but she had an angiosarcoma on the front of her shin, which I excised with a five centimeter margin and then put a skin graft on it for two years while she underwent radiotherapy. And we wanted to make sure the angiosarcoma didn't come back. Now the problem we've got is that a skin graft on the front of the shin is not very resilient. And particularly as she was a scuba diver, she was finding that it was continually breaking down. And she said to me, Mark, can we possibly please replace it with normal tissue? And on the front of the shin, I was thinking that we would need to use microsurgery and possibly a free flap. However, I thought based on our study before, so I did some tomography, which I, sorry, didn't save, but it showed that there was a big perforator just sitting on the edge of this flap here. So what I did is I made an incision on the edge of my flap and you go underneath the deep fascia and then you can see the perforator coming through. So you go under the deep fascia and you look for this perforator. So I did that. I went under here, found that perforator. In fact, it was there. And then I got my thermography and I looked and I saw as another perforator out on the corner here. And I know therefore that I can capture the tissue in between the two perforators. And because this tissue is lax, it means that I can, in theory, close this tissue directly. So here's me halfway through. So this is my perforator coming through the deep fascia. This is the saphenous vein and the saphenous nerve. And what I do is you raise it up on this perforator. And remember we said the perforator will supply a block of tissue and you can capture all the tissue between two perforators. So perforator, next perforator up here, I can safely capture all of that tissue. Then I simply rotate it through 180 degrees. So that's gone from here around to here. This is my saphenous nerve saphenous um, and saphenous vein. This is my defect, uh, I've transferred it in here. Note that I haven't excised my skin graft yet. I wanna see that it's going to reach, obviously. So tack it in, I'm able to close 
that defect behind it uneventfully. Here's the flap after I've excised the skin graft, inset the flap, and this is the flap at uh, one week postoperatively. And this is the patient at th three months postoperatively. So, and this is the end of my talk, and hopefully I can, this has been relatively clear. Um, so the first takeaway point is that harvesting a flap in mobile tissue, that is over the top of a space, pre-selects for a bigger perforator with a larger angiosome. Remember those trees that are widely spaced apart. So you want to get mobile tissue because you're going to have individual perforators that are wider apart, but each one of those perforators is going to be much bigger. And therefore, you're going to have a much more reliable flap. And if you're harvesting tissue in mobile, sorry, harvesting a flap in mobile tissue, you can almost close the donor defect directly. And in the limbs, it tends these, the orientation of these flaps tends to be best made longitudinal in association with nerves, if you could find them. And in the abdomen, circumferentially, again, following the dermatonal distribution or orientation to give you guidance. Two, if you know uh, whether a proposed flap contains true or choke anastomoses, you can safely predict how much tissue can be safely transferred before surgery. And as we said before, the exact location and the type of the interconnection can now be determined inexpensively through one of these digital smartphone attachments called either a FLIR, there's a couple of others on the market as well too. The, they're incredibly accurate. So there was a study published in England two years ago and it showed that the correlation between thermography, CT angiogram and Doppler was 97.8%. So very, very accurate indeed. And lastly, the identify, identification of choked anastomoses within a proposed flap allows strategic man manipulation of those anastomoses into true anastomoses before your definitive surgery. And therefore, by surgically delaying the flap, you can ensure that the entire flap will survive when transferred. So remember that girl with the breast reconstruction? There is no way we could transfer that entire flap on a one millimeter perforator. We would have ended up with half the flap dying. But by using delay, you can transfer the whole flap and it's an easier operation. Okay, so what can go wrong? Assuming that a wider flap is safer and more reliable, as we've been able to show, is wrong and incorrect. Two, the supplying perforator is usually not in the center of the tissue that you want to transfer and is often at the edge of the mobile tissue. Remember we talked about that. So perforators are gonna come through into the overlying tissue at the edge of the spaces, around the outside of the spaces. And so that's where you wanna be looking for your perforators. And lastly, transferring a flap that is composed of two or more underlaid choke vessels or choke zones will result in the death of the flap at that second choke zone. So you do not want to be raising flaps composed with choke vessels. Thank you. Great, Mike. That's terrific. Um, Mark, we have a number of questions. Um, um, firstly, congratulations from a number of people. Uh, there's one here from Muhammad Ramadan, which are, um, is there any way to convert choke to true anastomosis other than by delaying the flap, let's say connecting to a high pressure or big recipient vessel in the head and neck region? No. No. That's the short answer. <laughs> no, the it, short doesn't, answer. it doesn't work. There are lots of people who have tried that. Um, and, and the other thing too, it's critically important, you must wait three days. Ideally, you'd be waiting a week, um, but you saw what I did. You just interconnect. You, just, you basically make your flap that you want to raise and leave it attached at the tip and put your perforator down the bottom. And then you wait a minimum of three days, but ideally a week. And then it will convert it and it's absolutely safe. But high pressure, all those other things, it doesn't work. It also doesn't work in the post-mortem room. We've tried it no. on our experimental <laughs> studies. You cannot convert 
um, vessels to larger vessels just by pressure. Uh, another question mark um, from Gerardo Germa. Great Zoom. I always thought that the blood flow could pass through one choke anastomosis. Now I know the difference between two and token anastomosis, two and choke vessels, where you actually gain the extra, the extra. Um, um, Correct. Yeah. So you you can you can uh, uh, Russell and um, Russell. This is work Russell and Ian did ages ago. But you you can confidently capture the tissue between perforators and you can usually capture a bit of tissue on the other side of that second perforator yeah. but you get one more per one more uh, angiosome yeah you get one and a bit but again i'm trying to make it as simple as i can i wouldn't sure. the take home message is the tissue between perforators is safe the tissue on the other side of the perforator is unreliable yeah uh, another question from Sharing Penjor. Generally, which side of the body tissue serves as the best donor tissue? It's not really, it's really the, yes, that's what you want. Yeah. Um, so the best donor tissue, so ideally, and that's what I was saying before, ideally what you want to do is take tissue which is coming from a mobile area. And there's two reasons for that. One is that the vessels are going to be further apart and so the geographical location means that your flaps automatically are going to be able to be much longer and more reliable. The second is that because the uh, perforators are more widely spaced apart, they're going to be bigger. So therefore, you're going to be able to see them and use them more effectively and more safely. And thirdly, by harvesting tissue from mobile tissue, you can close that donor defect directly. Yep without a skin graft or anything else like that. So if you had to, what's the best place for a donor, tissue, donor site, then mobile tissue. Mobile the, tissue. Yeah. That's for a skin flap. Yeah. I'm talking skin flaps, but there are other flaps, muscles and whatever. Another question from Rachna Ram. Um, what is the role of radiological delay? Uh, I haven't used that. I would say limited. Limited because you only get because the advantage of the other delay is you to delay a, a whole lot of connections all around and a whole lot of perforators much harder to do unless you're delaying one single vessel. Yeah, I mean you can try. You can. There's two things about that. One is that you need interventional radiologist, and you're trying to selectively target a perforator which may be only one millimeter in size, and trying to cannulate that is incredibly difficult. Um, and you don't do anything to the subdermal plexus. So there was a big article uh, published in PRS Global Open last year talking about delaying Dieppe flaps, as I showed you before, but without doing the skin incision. So just doing it, trying to take out the perforators as they came through. And they found that they still had about a 20 to 25% necrosis rate at the tip of their flaps. So yes, you can radiologically delay it. It's expensive, it's difficult, and it's time-consuming, and it's not as effective as using a scalpel and completely delaying it, as I showed you. A lot quicker, and it's, a, lot quicker and a lot easier. Yeah. Um, Mark, um, a question here from uh, Gerald Abbasamas. A great talk. Um, when you use thermography, do you have to routinely cool the area? Uh, yeah, so um, as you, it's, it's one of those things that it's really helpful to play around with it a lot before you try and use it on something that really matters. Um, so if, I'm, if I've got a, a flap that I'm worried about, then sometimes I don't need to cool it. If I'm trying to really isolate where a, a perforator is, even just wiping the area with some alcohol. So you could just use one of those uh, wipes that they use to wipe down anything, you know, like hand surfaces or, uh, you know, in the operating theatre and they wipe all the, the operating table and the equipment and things down. You just put a bit of alcohol smeared over the skin. That will cool it down enough for the thermography to work. It's surprisingly accurate and sensitive. Um, in an ideal world, you would get one of those um, gel packs. Now, it's really important. They don't need to be at, you know, four degrees, you know, freezing. They're actually better if they're still at about... 15 or 16 degrees. So just a little bit cooler 
Uh, leave that on the skin for a good five to 10 minutes and then take that off and that will help you. But uh, with experience, no, you don't need to always cool the skin. Yeah. Um, where, where can they, someone wants to know where they can purchase a, a camera? Uh, just on the internet and there's, they're everywhere. So Amazon, Apple, all sorts of things. Just Google search uh, thermography cameras. As I said, that Fleur was the first one that came out, but um, I was speaking to Philip Blondiel last, uh, last month and he told me he's just found a new one which was cheaper and better uh, and he's been trying it out. So they're all about 300, two, 250 to 300 US dollars and Amazon will ship them to you. Okay. <clears throat> one question here, just um, when you're rotating that flap that you showed on the, on the leg there, how can you be sure you're not going to twist or constrict the vessel? Okay, so <laughs> um, that's where, when the first time you do it, that's when you get the heart rate certainly goes up a little bit. The key is that around that perforator, there will be a fine cuff of fibrous tissue. Um, and it's really important that you release and divide that fibrous tissue. So uh, on a vessel like that, you need either um, some magnification. So that could be operating loops. It could be a microscope. Um, and it doesn't need to be a plastic surgery microscope. It could be an ophthalmology microscope that you borrow from the theatre next door. You just need to be able to see that artery and that vein and you get some very fine blunt tip uh, scissors and you just, there's a little fibrous cuff. And as long as you release that, then you can safely rotate that through 180 degrees. Don't rotate it through 360 degrees, just 180. Another question here, Mark, is there any adjuvant medica medication that can potentiate the process of delay? People have tried a lot. Of We've tried that. So, I mean, we tried GTM, we tried all sorts of different things. Um, and again, the exact mechanism by which the delay process occurs has been, has been extensively studied, but no one absolutely knows what's going on. We think it's related to catecholamines and a whole variety of ner uh, nerve mediators. And people had looked at trying to augment that artificially or pharmacologically. Um, but again, as Russell and I were saying, the, the safest and the best way is to simply use a scalpel and do it three days before your definitive transfer. Yeah. And um, there's nothing's ever, people have tried all sorts of things, but nothing's ever really no. come up with the goods. Um, now, uh, where have we got another one here? Uh, in the case of graftery, the spit of poor thickness, sometimes it fails. Is this because of poor blood supply to the graft or infection? Um, <laughs> probably the so sure two things. It's either, it's either infection, that'll kill. So if you've got a beta hemolytic strep, so a group A streptococcus with its um, yeah. streptokinase, that will absolutely chew through your graft very, very quickly. So it could be that you have underlying infection. It could be that you you're trying to graft it onto a bed which doesn't have a good blood supply. So grafting on, onto a bed which is healthy and is actively bleeding is always a, uh, an important first step. And then, as we all know, immobilisation and elevation of that affected area for at least a week after surgery is critically important. The thing I'd say if you're in the tropics is it's, you probably would want to check your skin graft at 48 hours after transfer just to check and make sure things are okay. Just because you're in the tropics, it's much hotter and much more humid. And so things can get infected much more quickly than down here in cold Melbourne. It's one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that you can, you can look at grafts open. You can leave the skin grafts open and, yeah. and just put a bandage around the outside and protect them. But, and then you can inspect them every day and see if anything's accumulating underneath them, see if they're infection and deal, deal with them at the time. Yeah, and if you can put holes in your graft too. So you can, you know, your scalp, you can put lots of little holes in it. And then Russell and I were always taught you can roll it. So what we mean by that is that you can use a Q-tip or a cotton bud. And if there is a little collection, you can roll or uh, gently ease out that fluid underneath the graft into one of your little holes or make a new hole and express that fluid out from underneath the graft so it's got a close approximation to the bed. Doesn't help it if the bed's not got a blood supply though. Yeah. Um, 
Mark, how do you how do you determine the area of excision around a around a perforator and a perforator flatten? I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, so what I would do so if you're the first thing you do is got to find your perforator. So you, you're going to go straight up to a mobile area, and then with your thermography. So there's a couple of ways you could do it. You could do it like I did, which is you make an incision on the edge of your defect go underneath the deep fascia and gently lift that deep fascia up and you can see the perforators coming through uh, from the floor going up into the roof, which is your deep fascia. So then you've got your perforator, you know where it is, and then grab some mobile tissue around that. Now, if you've got thermography, you um, can rapidly, or Doppler, you can rapidly pick up where that second perforator is. But alternatively, if you're in a mobile area, you again it depends upon the intrinsic blood supply but what you're trying to do is go to the next perforator and ideally work out which perforators are connected by true anastomosis i mean on the lower leg for example you can routinely without delay raise a flap that can be 30 30 35 centimeters long and two centimeters wide as long as it's got true anastomosis in it and incorporating the sural vein or sural nerve and therefore the sural artery into your flap um, allows you to raise a very, very long flap without delay on a single perforator, which can be proximal or distally located. Mark, what do you do with a flap that's obviously got, got trouble, having trouble, either venous or arterial, um, and say so the end of the flap is dying, what, what's your protocol? Um, so the first thing is you want to pick it up early and almost invariably, it never gets better. So if you pick it up, you need to do something about it and you need to either hook up an artery or a vein. So the best way, if you can, is to find that second or third perforator or a draining vein and hook it up to an additional vein somewhere close by. So if we're doing a breast reconstruction, we would hook up the superficial inferior epigastric vein to the cephalic vein. If we're on the leg, we would try and hook it up to the saphenous vein. On the arm, we'd try and hook it up to the cephalic or the basilic vein. Um, so veins tend to be a little bit easier to find than arteries. The arteries and the perforators tend to be much more difficult to locate. But if you can find an artery, that's ideal. If you can't, hooking up a vein to a surrounding uh, vein the front, the tip of your a vein, and the tip of your flap that's under, um, under duress and is being compromised to a surrounding vein is what I would do, and do it early. Don't don't do it tomorrow. Do it tonight. Yes, the big danger is, is waiting too long. Is your tendency is to think it's going to get better. It's going to get better. You really want the Tony Kane principle. If you think it's dead, it, it is dead, and it's been dead for a couple of days. You want, you want to get it before you've made your mind up, up that yeah. it's dead. You, you just jump onto it early. If, so there are all the people who are the really good microsurgeons. So the guys around the world who do flap surgery and perforated flap surgery all the time, almost every single one of them would have like, they would add in a venous, second venous anastomosis at the tip of their flap almost as a routine. I think um, I think we've probably done pretty much all the questions there, unless somebody's got something further to add. Um, so I think we might um, call it a day there. Okay. Well, thank you. So for everyone, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, Russell and I have worked together with Ian Taylor for a very, very long time. Um, and we're both active and very keen uh, supporters of Interplast. Um, you can contact either Russell or myself very easily and very readily through the Interplast office. You can speak to Jess in the office there and she can um, forward any questions or anything that you're worried about. Both Russell and I are located in Melbourne where Interplast offices are, um, but there's a very broad group of plastic surgeons all around Australia. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, Simon Thompson down in Tasmania runs a hands-on uh, a surgical dissection and flap course. He runs it every second, sometimes every year. Uh, again, you're all welcome to attend that. And Interplus, where we can, tries to support uh, surgeons from developing countries in the Asia-Pacific region to come to that course. 
uh, Russell, as you probably were if you're in Bangladesh or India or Sri Lanka, would know that Russell runs a, a similar course in Bangladesh each year. So what I would say is if you're interested in plastic surgery and you want to learn more, then please sing out to us, uh, contact Interplastic Office. Um, we're readily available. We'd love to help and we want you to do better at your surgery. We run lots of courses. We all travel to Pacific um, at least every year or two years, uh, wherever we can. It's been a bit difficult with coronavirus. Um, but please, get in contact with Interplast. Let us know you're out there and we'll do whatever we can to help. All right. Thanks, guys. And Thanks enjoy your Friday night and um, we'll speak soon. Cheers. Okay. Ciao.